Praise the Lord, saints. Once again, welcome to our house on Wednesday for Bible study. I welcome you into this room and into our home. Most of all, we welcome you into the presence of the Lord. I want to just say, first of all, congratulations to Malcolm and Audrey Wilson and to their their granddaughter, Victoria, and her husband, E.J. Martinez. They are new parents, brother and sister Wilson, new grandparents, as of about 4.30 this morning. Adeline Rose. Now, let me give you several phrases uh, about baby Addie, as she will be called. Uh, of course, these were supplied by grandma, you understand. She is beautiful, and she has lots of black hair, brown eyes, and she smiled at her mommy, and she is beautiful, and 20 inches long, and 6 pounds and 11 ounces, and she is beautiful. And so we congratulate Malcolm and Audrey upon the birth of their new grandchild. Also, I want to just inform you that there are going to be some uh, changes about regulations for the COVID uh, virus with regard to churches. Dr. Henry is going to be supplying those hopefully in the next very few days. I was in touch today talking with a lady from Public Health, uh, Provincial Health Authority, and she assured me that they are working on new protocols. We hope and pray that they will be very amenable to our a great desire to worship the Lord together once again in our facilities. Meanwhile, here we are in the house of the Lord that is provided simply because of his word and the fellowship of his spirit. I'm, I, I'm inclined today to speak about places in the life of a Christian. Have you ever found yourself in the wrong place and isn't it a wonderful feeling when you can say of a surety that I'm in the right place I'm where God wants me to be unfortunately life has some bitter places and I suppose we've all uh, made uh, a stop or two at one or two of those places in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 22 through 25, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Isn't that quite a change? They had just crossed the Red Sea, and now they down don't have any water to drink. Verse 23, when they came to Merah, they could not drink of the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Merah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. 
the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? I want to tell you that there are no substitutes with God. They needed fresh water, potable water, drinkable water not only for themselves and their children, their babies, they needed water for their cattle. And they had a lot of cattle that they had just crossed the Red Sea from Egypt with. No substitutes for water. Man has invented and created a lot of substitutes, even in the food area and in the liquid area but really there is no substitute for water i remember when i was just a little boy dad and mom had just uh, begun a new job they had attempted to purchase a new vehicle and they did it was a wonderful and beautiful 1950 Studebaker champion, brand new. Dad felt that they really need to be conservative with their finances in order to pay for that vehicle. And so he said, we're going to have to cut back on some of the menu items. Well, we already were... Uh, pretty much established as a potatoes and uh, pasta, macaroni, uh, lots of vegetables, very little meat, some chicken. And dad made the decision that we couldn't afford to buy milk. Therefore, we would have to substitute powdered milk. Have you ever drank powdered milk? I would suggest you not because it's not pleasant. As a matter of fact, in my notes, just to describe powdered milk, I have written a three letter word spelled Y-U-K, yuck. But we drank powdered milk for quite some time. Was I ever so glad? When the word was given, we can buy milk now because God has helped us to pay for the car. I was so happy. And Moses told God, they're about ready to stone me. And I need, I need an answer for these people. And the Lord showed Moses a tree which when he had cast into the waters. Now, you need to understand there is something not spoken, but you have to understand Moses plucked up the tree. He pulled up the tree or he cut it down. But the fact is Moses procured the tree. You can talk about Christ. You can discuss Christ. You can enroll in Bible classes about Jesus. But my brother, until you take him into your life, bring him unto yourself and embrace him, you will not see any appreciable change in your life. Moses obtained that tree and he brought it unto himself. And the Bible says, when he had cast it into the waters, the bitter waters of Merah, that the waters were made sweet. One of the things that you're going to hear today in this brief Bible study is that there is a great correlation between materialism and material things and spiritual applications into our lives because God often speaks to us and reveals things to us 
in symbols. And this tree that Moses cast into the water was in fact a symbol of the cross. One other thing, you'll find this borne out clearly in the book of Revelation, that usually when you try to make an application from a symbol of water, you will find that it has many times an application to people. The Bible speaks in Revelation, John heard a sound as the voice of many waters, many people. And so the cross has to be cast into or placed into, preached, if you will, into the hearts of the people. That's why yours truly preaches often about the cross. Because without the cross, there is nothing to sweeten the bitter places in our life. And there came a promise from God that he gave to Moses, and it was this that if you will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight, he said, I will give ear to your commandments and if, and if you will give ear to his commandments, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. So when that tree was cast into the waters, that's a time for us to listen and to learn. For God really had said, if you'll listen and do that which is right, then I will be Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord that healeth thee. Take the cross, believe in the crucifixion, Believe in the sacrificial offering of himself upon the cross. Hear the words of Jesus as he cried on the cross, it is finished. And when he cried those words, what he was also among other things speaking of was that the work of healing was bought and paid for by the wounding and the stripes upon his back. And we have evidence of that from Isaiah, who looked forward to Calvary and said, by whose stripes we are healed. Peter looked backwards toward Calvary and said, with whose stripes ye were healed. Your healing is paid for today if you can believe God, if you are in obedience to his commandments and his ordinances, and if you're living according to his statutes, my God has given you the promise that he will put none of these diseases upon you. He came to, to heal them that are sick. He came to open the blind eyes and the deaf ears. He came to loose the dumb tongue. He came to heal the crippled legs. Oh, we serve the healer of all diseases. The bitter waters of Jericho are another place that we stop by sometimes. This was just at the edge of the now destroyed and totally uh, archaeological ruins of Jericho. It's mostly an agricultural site now, very rich and fertile land around about. Sister Mason and I were there several years ago. We saw a large tree with a pool of water that flowed around its roots in a controlled uh, little dam and ditch system. And it goes all the way back to the book of Second Kings chapter 2, when Elisha was invited by some of the men 
that were attending a Bible college that he was prominent and uh, present in teaching in that school. And they invited Elisha to help them to build a larger Bible school. First of all, the waters of that spring were bitter. And so the men of the city said unto Elisha, the situation of the city is pleasant. Even though Jericho is now in ruins, look at all the fertile land, agricultural land. But the water is not, and the ground is barren. He said, bring me a new cruise. The word is vessel. Bring me a new vessel and put salt in it. They brought it to him and he went forth to the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there. And he said, thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And so in symbolism, once again, the new cruise would just simply remind us that when we come under the subjection of our Lord, he makes us a new vessel. He sends us to the potter's house and we are shaped and formed on the potter's wheel according to his pleasure. But even then, sometimes there are flaws that develop in us and he must remove the flaws and make us all over again a vessel of his choice. Secondly, the content was to be salt. Salt is a type of something that is incorruptible. Salt is a purifier. And so once we have a new vessel, we fill it with something that cannot be corrupted. And so we have a new creature with the spirit of God, which cannot be corrupted. The pure and wonderful spirit of the Holy Ghost. If the salt that is in you, if it in fact has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be cast out. And so it reminds us, my dear friend, that we need to continually stay in touch with God for a fresh renewal of that incorruptible spirit of the Holy Ghost. Now, we are the salt of the earth. And we need to be aware that so many people are depending upon contact with us for that incorruptible force of the Holy Ghost in us is able to influence the sinner that they need to be changed, that they need to be made anew as a new creature, a new vessel, and they need to be filled with a new spirit, a new attitude, a new being. So consequently, we find that there is also frustrating places. It was Elisha with that group of men that wanted that water, that spring, which by the way has now his name. It's called Elisha's Spring. And Sister Mason and I saw a trailer load of cabbages being hauled out of that field. And the cabbages were as large as basketballs. They were the largest cabbages I have ever seen. What a fertile place. Because once that which was stale and stagnant has been totally changed because that which is barren and that which is undesirable is now made sweet. I'll tell you what, there will be a difference in the fruit and in the produce that comes from it. Consider the fact that life's frustrating places often conceal the things that God would have revealed in your life. 
there were a group of young men that were attending that Bible college. They said, Elisha, won't you go with us and we will cut down some timber and we'll bring the, the timber back down the mountain and we will increase the size of our Bible school. We'll build a larger accommodation for this facility so that we can have more people studying about the things of God. And Elisha said, okay, I'll go with you. And so when they went up the mountain, and by the way, that's a comment that, desi that deserves some uh, understanding. There's no gain with no pain. It's not always easy to walk with Christ or to walk with the ways of God because often it will lead you up the mountain. Oh yes, there are many testimonies of I was on the mountain or I was on the mountain peak. But my friend, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and you have to use strength to achieve the high places in God. And I would only encourage you to not forget that the purpose of your, attend, of your ascension on the mountain is to bring wood from the top of the mountain down for the purpose of increasing and enlarging your area of service in the kingdom of God. Christ is always close by. And we can prove that by what happened. While they were cutting down trees, one of the young men cried out to Elisha and he said, Alas, for it was borrowed. And Elisha said, What are you talking about? He said, I borrowed somebody's axe. And while I was cutting down the tree, the axe head flew off and landed in the river. And I don't know where it is. Elisha said, where did it fall? And the young man pointed to the area of the river. It fell somewhere in there. Now listen to me carefully. Friend, whatever you think would be choice for your life, you'll get nowhere if you avoid the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is an element of service that cannot be avoided. So many times, Jesus told various ones, take up thy cross and follow me. Not only did Moses cut down a tree or pluck up a tree and cast it in the bitter waters of Merah, but Elisha cut down a tree. Let me read it for you. Elisha cut down a tree and cast it into the waters and the iron did float. The point to be made here, the nature of iron is to sink. The nature of iron is to go down, not come up. The nature of iron never accommodates flotation but the cross when it is accommodated into your life the cross that is applied into your life will always go against the nature of events in your life everything can be down everything can be negative Everything can be horrible and wrong in your life. But I tell you that when you cast the cross into your life, you'll find that a lot of things you thought had sunk forever will soon be floating. And all you have to do is reach out and take them. So you have to go to the mountain, move up higher in your life. I might just say, if you've been in the church for a while, how long has it been since you felt you were growing in God? You need to cut down some wood. Bring it. You know, wood is a living substance. Don't spend your time in the cemetery. 
There's a scripture that says, why seek ye the dead? Why seek ye the living among the dead? The angel asked that of the disciples of Jesus. Why are you seeking life among the dead? If you're going to cut down a tree, you cut down that living tree because you are going to build a house for God. And in that house, people are going to find new life. They're going to lose the deadness of sin and begin to exercise in the power of the living Christ. Thirdly, give consideration to life's stormy places. I would only remind you quickly of a few different ones so that time does not forsake us totally. Jonah. He fled from God. And if you think you're the captain of the ship of your life, I just want to give you a word of caution today. You just never know what's on board your ship. The captain of that ship that was going down to Joppa, he just thought he had a passenger named Jonah. He did not know that Jonah was bringing with him a storm like this crew of sailors had not encountered in all of their years. The wind howled. The waves were absolutely gigantic, crashing against the ship. The ship was bucking up and down and swaying Oh my, it looked like they were going down. You never know what you have on board your life and you never know what it will cost you. When they brought Jonah on board, the Bible says that he paid the fare. Oh yes, Jonah paid to go to Joppa, but that crew of sailors they paid a greater price. The Bible says they threw all of their cargo overboard. They threw their tackling, all of their ropes and all of the things that were essential to maintaining the ship. They threw it overboard and they saw Jonah more or less holding on to the ship for dear life. And they said, call on your God. Why don't you get involved at the level of the spirit? Because we are going to go down. And Jonah said, okay, guys, relax. It's not your fault. It's not even the fault of the wind and the waves. It's my fault. I'm running from God. Before you bring somebody into your life as an influence, before you bring someone into your life as an advisor and a counselor, oh, my dear friend, please pay attention to what you might be bringing on board the ship of your life. Because all people who mean well may not be giving you good counsel. The Bible says, try the spirits and see if they be of God. I tell you that I have been chewed out. I have been shouted out, shouted at angrily by friends of people who were part of the church. And the people in the church had brought those friends into their life to help them during a tough time. But their friend certainly didn't buy into the authority or the leadership or the counsel and the structure of the church. The Bible talks about honoring them that have the rule over you. The Bible talks about giving honor to those that labor in the gospel and let them be counted worthy of double honor. You don't shout at preachers 
You don't touch God's anointed. You don't curse them, shake your fist at them. You speak reverently and honorably with them because they are in communication with God and with you for your soul. So <clears throat> stormy places. Jonah was at one of those places. Achan is another person that came to a stormy place in his life. He was a disobedient soldier. All the produce that emanates from the Jonas of your life and from the Achans of your life and one more, Saul, the disobedient king. All of the produce that flows from Jonah, Achan, Saul, it's going to have a bearing on the fruit that you gather into your life. And I want to say this with strong, strong authority today. The worry and the concern is not so much about you, sir, or you, ma'am. It's about your kids that are going to be influenced and usually negatively so. Let me finish today by talking about life's hopeful places. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Now, come on, follow with me here. You don't get a loaf of bread and throw it on the water of a lake or of a river or the ocean. And then keep watching the next day and the next day looking for that loaf of bread to come back. That's not going to happen. You throw a loaf of bread in the water and just in a few minutes it's going to get soggy and sink. But what it does indicate to us, once again I'm speaking to you in symbolism Remembering that the Bible was written by people whose residence primarily was in the Middle East and in countries where rice is one of their staples in their diet. And so an ancient and even often practiced method of planting seed for harvest was to flood a field, flood it with three or four inches of water, and then the sower would go forth walking in the water of the muddy field, casting the seed. Wheat seed is bread. Rice seed is bread. Are you with me? Cast the seed upon the water and it would float for a while and then sink. And as it sank, it would go down into the mud. In a day or two, the water itself would sink into the mud. Then slowly the mud would begin to dry. And as it dried, the seed would begin to germinate. And before long, the sprouts of the grain that was sown in that flooded, muddy field would begin to grow and produce wheat or barley or rice, oats, whatever kind of grain that had been sown. That's why the writer of Ecclesiastes said, cast your bread, your seed upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days. You walk out there one day and the field is not wet, it's not muddy. Now it's standing with waving grain and you take your knife, your sickle, and you harvest the grain you just found, the bread that you cast upon the waters. James said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold the husbandman, the gardener. Our word would be farmer. 
Behold, the farmer waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. A lot of patience required if a farmer is going to reap a harvest. The book of Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. We are justified by faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. One fellow said, O oh Lord, I need patience and I need it right now. Well, patience is where our soul resides. For the Bible says, in your patience, possess ye your soul. Don't get impatient in doing the will of God. Don't get impatient, though you have tried and you have tried. Remain faithful. Be patient. One day you shall reap. If you faint not, the Bible says that you shall reap in due season if you faint not. And so not only does tribulation work patience, but patience experience and experience hope and hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let me read that again, please. For when I was yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for Francis Mason. Would you like to try it and insert your name? For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for you and me, even though we were ungodly. Finally, and I conclude, Paul wrote to the preacher Titus, and he said, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Life does have a seemingly litany or a continual pattern of bitter places, of frustrating places, of stormy places. But I want to tell you that life's got some hopeful places. I have great hope that one day I will hear a trumpet sound. And when I hear the trumpet sound, I will begin to rise to meet Christ in the air with all the saints of God, both of ages past and ages present. I shall rise to meet his church, his people in the air. I want you to be part of that number. I want you to rise to meet with us in the air. Let us pray together. Lord, you're so faithful and so full of grace and truth. Every aspect of your dealings with mankind is with the tinge and the evidence of mercy. 
Mercy has never avoided its part in salvation. We didn't, we didn't deserve it. We only should have received judgment, but you gave us mercy. In great mercy, you brought us from a long way off. When we were drinking the bitter waters of life, you made them sweet when you went to Calvary's cross. And there you paid the price that we might have sweetness of life rather than the bitterness of this sinful world. There have been people who have listened to this video broadcast today. There will be people who will listen to it tonight. And I pray, O oh God, do not let them despair because of all of the bitter places and because of all the frustrating places, because of the stormy places. Let them, O oh God, look up with joy, with anticipation, with hope, knowing that soon you're coming back for your people. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you, my friend. Join us in this broadcast. Join us at church if and when you hear that we are open and having church but we invite you to become part of us. And we thank you for it. Amen.